Hello and welcome to our online learning segment on teaching with objects. My name is Jessica Ellison and I'm a teacher educator in K-12 programs and services at the Minnesota Historical Society. You can reach me at jessica.ellison at mnhs.org. All of the links that are featured here in this segment and all of the activities will be included at a Google Doc which is linked at the very end of this presentation. So you don't need to make sure that you're taking down all the URLs while we're presenting. So let's get started. Why should we teach with objects? Where do we find them? And how do we use them in classrooms? These are the things we're gonna be talking about in this 10 minute segment. So let's jump right into it. What is an object? Generally, it's called an artifact. It's a part of material culture. They're usually non-text non-paper historical items. They can be something that is used in daily life or something that has become very famous, such as the object you see pictured here, which was the gun that was used to assassinate President Abraham Lincoln in April of 1865. So why should we use objects? Well, objects tell stories about the daily lives of real people that lived in the past, and they can often fill in gaps left by written documents. Not all people and not all societies have been literate and have written down their stories. And so objects can be a way to kind of fill in those stories and tell a different point of view. The object you see here is actually a human skull that was found in Jamestown, Virginia just a couple of years ago. And it was definitive proof of cannibalism at Jamestown, which they had thought had happened at Jamestown, but there had never been quite the proof. This goes to show that history is always being discovered as new objects are reevaluated and found. So why should we use objects? Well, they're authentic. They tell a really authentic story about life in the past. They're valuable for young students, for readers who struggle a little bit, or students who are ELL. And learning to read an object helps things like deductive reasoning and understanding of multiple perspectives. And I think really importantly, they help bridge the past and present, especially when you can find an equivalent of a historic object today. So why do they need you? Students might look at this object and not have any idea what it is. Or they might kind of look at it and say, well, that looks a little bit like food. It might be a cracker, but why do we care about this cracker? They need you to help find clues, to help do research, to see that this is in fact a cracker, but it's a 150-year-old cracker. This is hardtack, which was eaten by soldiers during the Civil War, and it's, this piece is actually currently in the Minnesota Historical Society collections. So it's up to you as the teacher to get them to ask the right questions. Why is this object, this 150-year-old piece of food, in the collections of the Minnesota Historical Society? And what was the importance to Civil War soldiers at the time? Primary source analysis is something that needs to be modeled and rehearsed and done consistently. You need to make sure that you're providing adequate context so students know information beforehand about what objects they're going to be looking at. Do things like lead off with warm up activities or practice as a class. The most important thing though is just to make sure that primary source analysis is a regular activity in your classroom. So where do we find these objects? The resources on this list include a couple of different things historical societies, and museums, both local and national. Local historical societies and state historical societies can be a great place to find objects online. The Minnesota Historical Society has thousands of artifacts that are digitized and you can view them on the website. Colonial Williamsburg is a great place to get artifacts from the colonial, revolutionary, and new nation period. And then other state historical societies, such as the New York Historical Society, have a lot of great things that relate to both New York and national history. Don't forget about museums. Museums are one of the best places that you can go to find artifacts and objects because, in general, museums are collecting institutions. The Smithsonian Institutions has more than a dozen museums, and you can view their collections online, which you can search by subject or by object group. The British Museum is another great place to get resources. The British Museum website in general, britishmuseum.org, but then also the one listed below, which is a, a website that was created for educators and students and includes 100 objects from history to help teach the story of British history and the world. 
the National Park Service is one that is a really great place that a lot of people don't think about to get objects, but they have museums and they have collections as well. This key that you see featured on the page is a skeleton key that was used to Abraham Lincoln's Springfield home and is featured in the collections of the National Park Service. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum is another great place to get artifacts that were either donated to the museum by Holocaust survivors or the families of victims. So how do we get started in classrooms? Well, first you have to get kids used to seeing objects. So you can have students bring in objects of their own. The image that you see here is an image of a classroom museum where a middle school teacher from Minnesota has his students bring in an object from their house that means something to them the first week of school. And they create a classroom museum that lives all around them the entire school year. Have replica objects on hand that students can see or start lessons with an object dissection. Have kids look at objects to begin a lesson on a subject. Making inferences is a really great skill that comes out of teaching with objects. Provide objects to groups of students, but don't tell them necessarily much about it. Just let them start to look at it and ask things like, what does it look like? What is it made of? Does it look like anything that you recognize? What was it used for and who used it? Or what other information do you need to understand this object so that students can start to just make inferences based on what they see and feel? Take a look at this object. Now, if you were just to look at this object, what might you see? Well, there's a string. It might be made of metal or maybe an intricately carved wood. And as you start to look at it, you can see that it, the top comes off. Well, what if I told you that this was a cutlery holder? that when people traveled in the late 18th century, early 19th century, they carried along their knife and their spoon with them when they were on the road. A really great object that maybe isn't used anymore, but can tell a really good story about travel in the late 18th century. Analysis, have students analyze what's called the life of an object. What is the story of that object? They can build a classroom museum or analyze the role of a famous object such as the, the gun that shot Abraham Lincoln. Or maybe compare an old object with a modern equivalent, such as a telephone. Or students can write a biography of an object. Where did it start and how did it get to where it is now? Use objects as an anticipatory set. Put an object up on the screen, do a think-pair-share, and then come back together to reveal the object's identity. This object is one of the only surviving chests that was thrown into the Boston Harbor during the Boston Tea Party. Now you can also use objects to humanize history, to emphasize a point or to get an emotional response. These are George Washington's teeth. And as you can see, they are not very comfortable looking and you can talk to students about not just the first president, but also things like dental hygiene and technology at the time. Now this object is for maybe more mature, older students. This, these are force-feeding materials that were used on British suffragettes when they were in prison and going on hunger strikes to protest the fact that they couldn't vote in Britain. It's a very emotional object and something that you can use to talk to your students about what suffragettes were willing to do to get the right to vote. Make connections. Build empathy by sharing objects that have modern equivalents. Shoes are one that I always like to talk about because we all wear shoes. We've worn shoes almost our whole lives. And you can find examples of shoes, such as this small child's shoes that are in the collections of the Holocaust Museum that belong to a young victim of the Holocaust. It's an emotional way to get kids thinking about what was then and what is now. Pair objects with other sources. You can share an object and then start to add sources as clues. Like if you look at this object, kids might be able to come to the conclusion that it looks like a camera and they'd be right. What if I brought in this image? That's an iceberg far in the distance. Do you see what we might be coming at here? I'll show you another one. Here's another object, a life vest. And then finally, the Titanic. The camera was the one that was used by a passenger on the Carpathia to take pictures of Titanic survivors. And you can have students create a time capsule with objects. Have them create one that represent an era, a place, or a particular person. These three objects represent World War II. 
And of course, there are many more objects that you could choose to represent this era. But by giving students the choice and telling them that they have to make the decision about what objects represent an era, place, or person, that empowers them to think about what is meaningful for them and what they think best represents that time period. And of course, you can bring in the real thing. Visit antique stores or secondhand stores or the online versions and buy historical objects for your classroom. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to be something that students have ever seen before or something, again, that has a modern equivalent. But getting something that a student can hold and touch and get the feel of really brings that authenticity to life. You can also buy cheap replicas at museums of things like bullets and coins and buttons and things like that. Because again, getting kids to have that tactile connection with an object gets, it, gets them thinking about these ordinary people living these ordinary lives or perhaps extraordinary lives in the past and how they can relate to it. So the URL you see at the top bullet there is the Google Doc that includes all of the URLs that were mentioned here and all of the activities. So you can write that down and then access that Google Doc and you can get all the information here. Couple of last words. Objects teach students to be questioners. It teaches them to say, what is this? What was it used for? And it makes them inquisitive. History is a story about complicated but also very familiar humans and objects really begin to start telling that story. And above all, they make history real. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at jessica.ellison at mnhs.org. Thank you.